All right. Hello, 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 everybody. I'm Bill Murphy, Jr. This is understandably.com. It's what I like to call understandably live, where we go out and interview just a really diverse group of interesting people, um, all kinds of things, authors, scientists. And today I have with me, um, somebody who's going to talk about something very topical, which is Brian Moody. He's the executive editor of Auto Trader, which we were just talking about. It's been around for a long time. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, buying a new car or a used car, whatever kind of car you want to buy during uh, this current uh, economic situation we have going on. So thank you for being here, Brian. Yeah, you didn't say it had to be interesting. I didn't know that part. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, was, uh, I was assured you'd be very interesting. Top two or three, I was told. Um, mm, I'm, I'm not a I'm, scientist, but yeah. I'm, I'm told you have a lot of, uh, you know, bon mots and, um, and jokes and whatnot. So we'll, uh, we'll be looking, <laughs> looking for those. <laughs> hey, sure. just a reminder, we've got people coming in here. I made a mistake before I sent out a calendar invite saying 1 p.m., which is where I've done, I've done a lot of these at 1 p.m. And then I had to update it at 2 p.m. I've sent emails out. So I think we're going to have people joining us. That's on me. My bad. Um, Reminders, uh, this is understandably.com. If you don't know the website, you should go there and sign up. There's a lot of great free stuff. And also, um, well, you'll know this if you're watching it on YouTube, but we record these and we post them. So um, if you're participating, you could wind up on YouTube. If you don't want to, then just uh, don't turn on your camera, et cetera. Um, final thing, people who are, uh, you know, the guests here, we've got uh, people from all over. If you guys want to say hello, say hello, say where you're from, that's great. Um, and also, as we go along here, you are more than welcome to suggest questions or comments in the chat box. So, um, Brian, we wrote a newsletter today talking about how a chip shortage and a bunch of other environmental things has led to a shortage of new cars, which in turn leads to a shortage of used cars. Did we get that right? Essentially, yes. Um, so a lot of the chip allotment, for lack of a better word, uh, some manufacturers deferred that. They're like, why do we want to buy things that we don't need? Because remember, there's a couple things to remember. People weren't buying cars in, say, March and April of 2020. Yep. Many manufacturers decided to stop or slow down production so that they could make medical supplies. And you know, when you have that happening, many automakers said, hey, we don't need to purchase this large allotment of microchips, not knowing what would happen would be that there would be a uh, uh, pent up demand. And then in addition, you have rental car companies who are selling off a lot of their fleet because they don't wanna be obligated to be making a payment on cars that aren't being rented. So now you have this, this, this horrible combination of um, you know, low supply, high demand, and that's what's driving the prices both new and used right now. So are you guys able to project somebody in your line of work? Are you able to project and say, well, this is, this is a 2021 problem. If you can wait till 2022, you're gonna be in better shape or what do we think? Well, yes, um, but it's a guess. And so it's essentially what you just said that, that we predict that by the time 2022 starts to you know, roll in, say, say early in the year, that a lot of the production capacities will be, will be catching back up and that a lot of those shortages will be, you know, for lack of a better word, they'll, they'll catch back up, I guess, as a way of saying. But in the meantime, you know, it's, it might be hard to find. It's not that you can't find a car. It's just that it's going to be specifically hard to find that one thing that you want. Mm -hmm. And the more flexible you are, the better chances you are of having what you want. You know, you mentioned a factor that I hadn't thought of, which was, um, you know, companies not just slowing down production, but I don't know, a year ago, a year plus when this all started and we talked about having a shortage of ventilators. Right. Uh, I remember that, you know, I, I was a proponent of it for better or for worse, but there were, uh, you know, some car manufacturers talking about, can we retool and produce ventilators? Did that actually happen? And is that a factor at this point? Well, some manufacturers did actually produce medical equipment and medical supplies. And remember, this is similar. The, the, the really the best analogy is uh, for World War II, when it was sort of, you know, less, let's just say most manufacturers would have thought it was less optional. The fate of the free world is, is in the balance, that kind of thing. But we are seeing the effects of that because now it has, you know, sort of a domino effect. And in addition to them making medical supplies, the demand is picking up. So all mm. of those things are kind of conspiring at once to make, you know, a, a, a shortage. If you remember back in World War II, and that might be the case with some cars these days, there are certain years of car that don't exist. So mm. I, I forget what the year is back in the day. Is it is it 43? There may be no such thing as a 1943 Dodge, let's right. just say. Right. Some manufacturers today have skipped either 2020 or 2021, hmm. and they may not have a, I, I'm making this up, they may not have a 2021 Chevrolet Traverse, let's just right. say. Right, right, right. So um, 
running the site that you run, what's, you know, can you give us kind of a, your nutshell best advice for somebody who's saying, well, you know, I, I still need a car and I think I need right. to buy one this summer. What, uh, what are you telling people to do? Okay, so the, the, the basic thing is that yes, the prices in new and used cars have gone up. As an example, minivans have a very low supply, meaning there aren't many available, oh. and they've been transacting at 99.5% of the full sticker price, which means if you're going to buy a minivan, the I'll tell you what I'm going to do tactic is not going to work because they know five guys are waiting for the car after you just, they're just going to say next. But what you can do is you can look for things like um, be flexible on the car that you want. So if you know you want a Camry, you should be able to get a Camry. But will you be able to get one that has, you know, I want beige interior and I want a blue stripe and it has to be white and it must have these specific wheel covers and I don't want a sunroof. The farther down that road you get, the less sure. likely you're going to be to get the car that you want. So be flexible, buy from the stock they have, that's gonna help you get the car that you want. And look for alternatives like, you know, don't pick the most popular thing most of the time. Sometimes picking the popular thing will help you because there's a large supply. So Jeep Wrangler, Ford F-150, mm -hmm. super popular. You're probably gonna find a bunch of those. Camaro and Corvette, they're already low production cars. I don't know that you're going to find a bunch of those. So look for something as an alternative. Honda Accord, say, instead of a Honda CRV. Okay. When I put out, I put out a, a, an inquiry for people who had expertise like you to say, you know, uh, um, what do you suggest? And one thing I heard over and over and read a few times had to do with uh, now is not a great time to buy an SUV or maybe a minivan, assuming you're trying to get that competitive deal or whatever. But sedans right. are better. Is that is that uh, seems like in my town anyway? It seems like we're uh, you know we're uh, We've got an oversupply of SUVs on the road and not too many sedans anymore. Right. So all that, that's exactly right. And so what you're saying essentially is true. There's a large demand for SUVs. There's a low supply of most vehicles. That's, that's not the place to be if you want a deal. Now, if you just have to have a Chevy Tahoe and that's your thing yeah. and you don't care what it costs, and, and we've been seeing that there are people that are willing to do that because the transaction price, this is according to Kelly Blue Book, the transaction price has moved up over the last few months to it's over $40,000. So people are just saying, hey, I don't care. Just give me what I want. I want a Tahoe. I want it loaded. Whatever you have to do to get it to me, get it to me. And that's not everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not like that. I wouldn't spend whatever $85,000 on a car just because it's the one I want. I would wait for the right one for me, but right. everyone's different. Um, it's funny. We had some good questions coming in before this today. One had to do with, uh, you know, buy or lease right now, which is your better bet? Hmm. That's a good question. I think, I think that depends on the individual needs. So it's always going to be to your advantage. If, if your goal is to save the most money long-term buying is always better. But if you're on a, let's say that you're only in this country for a short period of time, or you're stationed someplace, or you have one of those traveling jobs. I'm planning, I'm planning another 50 years or so myself. So the, well, if that's the case, if you're the kind of person that keeps cars for like 20 years, 10 years, buy. Yeah. If you're the kind of person that wants something new every three years, and you want the newest technology, the newest safety, or you have a fixed amount of money for transportation, because you do a business or your own work from home then you can lease and get something maybe a little bit nicer. The problem with leasing is that whatever you spend on the car, you have no equity. You turn mm -hmm. it in and that's all them. They sell it and you don't get to have any of that. Yeah. And, and one kind of follow-up question, if I can just go right down the list of what people were asking me to ask you had to do with, uh, you know, are, are, are we going to see in three years, five years, a adjustment on the, on the price and value, especially of used internal combustion engine cars versus, you know, electric adoption. Is it going to happen that quickly or is it not? No. No, it's not going to happen that quickly. <laughs> I think that what's, what's happening with electric cars yeah. is that they're getting a disproportionate amount of headlines versus what people are actually doing. Okay. So right now, it's still 2% of the market. So electric cars, and, and there are some good ones, but right now, they are 2% of the market. If you have a, a used Honda Accord or if you have a used Ford F-150 for sale, five years from now, you're still going to be able to sell it and make the same amount of money mm. that you would have selling it it's not we're not there yet 30 years from now that's a different story okay now i think you thought you might have a list of specific makes or specific models things like that that uh i do you know, we have people all over the country and frankly we have people around the world too so i know obviously you can't say 
I mean, there's a geographic variance. Right. So but... this is specific to the U.S. Okay. So here's what I can share is that there are some models that we know on AutoTrader that are m most highly searched, right? Okay. So I'll, I'll give you a few of those. And they're obvious. This is no surprise. Ford F-150, Jeep Wrangler, Chevy Silverado, 1500, um, Toyota RAV4, um, Jeep Grand Cherokee, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So that's what people are searching for most on AutoTrader. However, those aren't the vehicles that are, have the highest availability. So when you look at cars that have the highest availability, they are vehicles like the Chevrolet Equinox, the Toyota Camry, the Honda Accord, the Honda Civic. You see where this is going? Yeah. Like it's, it's the, the Ford F-150, the Ram 1500, and the Jeep Wrangler are on that list too, but those are some of the few trucks and SUVs. A lot of the other ones are cars. I'm so sorry, those are on the list of also highest most available. Oh, okay. So high so a lot inventory. of search, but also high inventory. Right. So some of the ones like Honda Accord and Toyota Camry, they weren't on the list mm -hmm. of most searched. So that's where you're going to get a deal. Look for a car that's not that popular or that's so, sort of unpopular right now by body style. Let's say Chevy Malibu, Toyota mm -hmm. Camry. Those cars still sell well, but they're not nearly as important or not important, but they're not nearly as popular as something like say a Ford F-150, a Jeep Wrangler, a Ram 1500. So that's where you get the deal is go looking for a Nissan Altima. There's high availability of Nissans, mm -hmm. but low searches. At least this is just from auto traders perspective. Right, right. You guys are pretty big though. You, do you share any info on how many, uh, you know, how, how many searches you do or anything like that? I, I didn't ask this ahead of time. So I don't know. Yeah, what you so there's, a, there's roughly, I think there's something like 3 million cars that are listed for sale. So that's mm -hmm. pretty high. Um, there's roughly 17 million unique visitors per month in terms of traffic. So the trends that we see, I think it's safe to say that they're applicable to the broader society. And, and yeah. there's just two examples that, that go to show you. Well, one of the most searched cars on AutoTrader consistently is the Ford F-150. Mm -hmm. Well, that's because it's the most, it's the best selling vehicle in the country. So these things do line up. It's not, you know, you're going to get different answers probably from different people, but there's a lot of cars for sale and a lot of people looking for them. The thing that you can do with AutoTrader is you can at least sort in a way that most sites allow you to do this, but you can sort them in a way and they'll tell you how many at uh -huh. the top, like how many are available in your area. Got it. I searched for a Toyota Land Cruiser the other day just because for fun, because I like them. <laughs> when I set no parameters, no zip code, any distance, sure. there was less than a thousand of those for sale on Auto Trader. So that's not a place I would go looking for a deal. Right, right, right. Yeah. Now, this is kind of fun. It's, um, I think my, uh, my old economics professor would love to have this opportunity now. Uh, you know, it was kind of a long time ago, but to, uh, I mean, just pure supply and demand right. and uh, elasticity and everything. All these other buzzwords that I'm not sure I remember accurately from economics 101 a long time ago. But um, let me get to a couple of questions here. Too one is this is kind of long here. This is uh, this is Zach from YAA who I also quoted in today's article. Thanks for doing this. Uh, what do you think is going to happen with the new model year turnover that typically happens this time of year? I think I get where he's going here with Ford, GM, and other manufacturers producing inventory to 99% completion, but waiting for the chips to have them hit 100%. And then having them sit in fields, what happens when those cars, trucks, and SUVs eventually make it to the market when the 2022s are also being produced? Do you anticipate a lot of supply sometime for next sometime next year? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, well, so there's two things that we know that it's already happening. In some cases, they're not waiting for the chips. What they're doing is they're they're eliminating features or they're ramping down production. So mm -hmm. in certain models of pickup truck, I don't remember the exact brand but they have a cylinder deactivation feature. And basically it improves your fuel economy by one mile per gallon. Because that's controlled by a chip and most of the things in modern cars, many things, climate control, seats, seat yeah. warmers, many, many things that are controlled by some kind of a chip. This manufacturer opted to eliminate that feature, the cylinder deactivation, so that they could get trucks out the door. So that's, a problem if you're banking on that one mile per gallon, mm -hmm. but if you don't care about that, sure. this is a car that they're going to sell maybe minus some features. Maybe there are some options that they don't want. The other thing is in some cases, they're just skipping a model year. So if everybody I'm sure knows enough about cars to know that like the, the, you know, uh, what are the 2019 Toyota Camry is very similar to the 2020 Toyota Camry because it just got redesigned. 
well, if they skip a year and start calling it something else, who is going to know? It's it's they could just do whatever they want. They don't need right. to have, produce a bunch of 2021s. They could just call them 2022s and add some features, and then everybody thinks it's a new car. Sure, that's a good point. It's a good point. Um, actually, I have a question. We talk about adding an, or maybe even subtracting features because of chips. I'm just curious if if <laughs> this says a lot about me, but I get frustrated by the number of things that are added. In other, um, how do I put this? What's the simplest car? Are there still simple cars you can buy out there? In other words, I guess my wife will laugh if she watches this video. My pet peeve about having to hit the the radio eight different times to fade the volume from the back to the front right. of the car. I'm like, man, my 78 Cutlass, I could do that with a little dial. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, so what you've stumbled upon is not necessarily that it's not necessarily specific to you. That's just a user experience problem. Right. If I have to go through the menu eight times to adjust the fade to the front to rear, that's a poor design. Good technology should make your life easier. And if it doesn't, then that's a problem. So I have this theory that one day someone's going to invent the Luddite special, which is like a safe <laughs> car that's basic and yeah. has all the safety equipment, but doesn't have any, any of that extra stuff. It's just got like an air conditioner. The problem is, is that manufacturers make money on volume. Mm. So that's why it's cheaper to just say, hey, every car gets power windows. Right. Because at this point, it would be more expensive to say, oh, I want the, I want the manual ones. Right. No, I think you're right, actually. And you make a, a good distinction. It's, it's not being a Luddite. And, and I mean, I love technology, but as you say, it's a UX problem, right? That, right. <laughs> you know, that uh, leaning over there and pressing this thing eight times and knowing you probably shouldn't be doing this while you're switching lanes where I could just by muscle memory do it back in the and day. And if you but, really want that, then what yeah. you could do, you could go and buy, um, let's just say, a 1998 Oldsmobile. That's true. And you could do that if that's what yeah. if that was important to you. And you can get the antique plates to put on the back of the car too, and your <laughs> car insurance will go down. It's a win-win. So, <laughs> hey, another question here: What kind of impact, if any, do companies like Carvana and CarMax offering similar de delivery options have on the used car sales market? Um, I don't know about what impact they have on the market overall. I think what it does, what we've seen is that, like, so, so for 2020 with all of these COVID restrictions, I think mm. it's helped people to purchase a car when they may not have felt comfortable otherwise. So a lot of the changes that you see coming or that are here now, those were things that were already going to happen, right? So I can just tell you from an auto trader perspective, one of the things that was sped up was uh, they want to, people want to be able to filter when they're searching for a car and you can do this. I only want to see cars where I get a home test drive. I only want to see cars where they'll deliver it to me when I buy the car. Hmm. And I only want to see cars that will give me where the dealer will give me a video walk around. So that kind of thing was probably already going to happen, mm -hmm. but the COVID stuff sped it up. The same with shopping completely online, the same with, Hey, just bring me the car. The problem with just bring me the car is I feel uncomfortable if what's my recourse, if I didn't like it. And if I'm buying a Chevy from a Chevy dealer, I know they have a bunch more. Mm -hmm. But if I found that one super cool Lexus IS with this feature and that feature and they bring it to me sight unseen and it has a bent wheel or something, I'm like, well, now I, I just don't <laughs> want any Lexus. I want that Lexus, but I want it to be perfect. So right. it, it's, it gives access to more people is all that's really happened. Mm -hmm. When I think of uh, something like CarMax, I'm just thinking of I don't buy that many cars. I got to admit, I mean, where I live, it's, you know, we're a one car family. It's, it's, it's kind of a, it's a suburb for people who don't want to admit that they live in suburbs. Um, but uh, when I have done in the past, if, especially if I had something to trade in, I've, I think I've always, at least in the last 10 years or so, 15 years, at least gotten the, uh, the hip pocket offer from CarMax before going to trade it in. So do you guys have advice on that in terms of like, do you trade in a car? Do you sell it privately? Do you finance? Are you better off in cash? All that sort of stuff. All those things really just depend on who you are. I mean, that's the thing is that like, here's something that you have to consider. So if you want to sell your car privately as a private party, yeah. sites like Auto Trader and others allow you to do that. There's a mechanism to do that, right? You put it on Craigslist if you want, but that requires effort you have to clean it and you have to field the calls and you have to answer the creeper emails and you have to, you know, all that stuff. I'm not saying it's not worth it because mm -hmm. in some cases you may get thousands of dollars more for your car by selling it yourself versus trading it in. For me, my threshold is 
if it's less than a thousand dollars that I'm going to make in my pocket, right. I wouldn't, I'll just trade it in. It's not worth my time to do that. If it's $3,500, oh my gosh, I'm selling it all day long. I'll be out there <laughs> polishing it with by hand and right. I'll drive them to the bank if they want me to. But it, it really just depends on each individual person's thing. Trading it in is easier. And some people feel like that's the best way. Mm -hmm. Selling it yourself is more difficult, but there's oftentimes a reward for doing that. So it really just depends on sure. how, but, you're, how you're geared, you know, how you're wired. But do you think, I don't know, Joe or Jane consumer with let's call it average negotiating abilities does this every three years or four years or five years? Is he or she uh, going to get a better... Yeah, if you had to pick, right? I know, I know, it's, I know, it's everybody's different. But if you had to pick, do you say yeah. separate it all out, go in with cash, or no, 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 no? If you go in, if you tell them you have cash, then they know they can't get you on the financing. So wait, wait, spring the cash thing at the last minute. You know, I'm just curious if you have. Uh... So it's true that the <laughs> automakers and banks and financial institutions they definitely make money on points from loaning you the money to buy a car. <clears throat> that's that's part of the business. That's a yeah. business. The business of loaning money is a business. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. No. If you don't like that, then of course pay cash. But as far as, you know, what's the best way it, 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 it because it's so dependent upon supply and demand, like you might be able to walk into a specific dealership and find, like I one time went to this dealership in Culver city, California, and they had a three-year-old Buick Regal still in the showroom, brand new, never been sold, never been registered. I have a feeling I could get a great deal on that car if I wanted it. Mm -hmm. If I could offer them, hey, I'll give you this. It just depends on the supply and the demand of the car. And it depends on what's easiest for you. So cash deals, yeah, they're not going to make as much money in terms of financing for you. But who's to say you can't finance it and then pay it off a, a week later? And there's sure. also plenty of 0% financing deals too. I would do that or low APR, that kind yeah. of stuff. So there's all these different ways that you can do it. Most people don't have $30,000 to just walk in and write a check. If it's a $10,000 car, I would just pay cash and move on because mm -hmm. a used car loan is going to be so much higher in interest than a new car loan anyway. If you can afford to do that, or you can save up your money. If it's you know that old of a car, I would just pay cash. Uh, all other things being equal, which they won't be equal, but is it better to buy an older car with fewer miles or a newer car with more miles? All other things being equal. I would say shop by miles with one caveat. Okay. Unless it means you're not going to get some safety features. So mm. I would say by miles over a year, yep. unless it means, oh, I'm not going to get airbags okay. or I'm not going to get anti-lock brakes or stability control because the newer the car you get, the more common those features are. But generally speaking, let's just say that you have a, a car from a, the same generation, right? Like you say you have a, a, a Nissan Frontier pickup, which mm -hmm. is from, you know, a, a 2008 compared to a 2012. And the newer one has super high miles and the older one has low miles. I would go with the older one with low miles, assuming you're not going to get any subtraction on safety mm, features. Yeah. Um, another question somebody had was, um, and I think, well, I'll just ask the question, is, is you, you already pointed out that electric is, is still only about 2% of the market. However, uh, have they been hit the same way with the chip shortage? I don't know why they wouldn't, but. Yes, I yeah. mean, electric cars require more sure. of those. Um, but what, what we're seeing is, and this is smart on the part of the automaker is, what they'll do is they'll look at their, their, their total landscape and anybody would do this. And you say, what are our high volume cars? What are our yeah. high profit cars? Let's focus our chips on those and let's ramp down production on these other ones. That's, that's smart, mm -hmm. but yes. Uh, electric cars do need microchips just like everything else. In fact, they may right. even need more. Right. That, that makes sense, actually. I just want to, uh, if anybody else has specific questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I've got a few others here to ask myself, and uh, I'm sure Brian will have some other thoughts. Um, one question I just had, and this is for anybody in your position or, or car dealers in general, everybody, always, everybody had always heard, you know, go in on the 30th of the month, the 31st of the month, you'll get the better deal then. And then I've heard that car dealers got wise and change their, you know, our, internally our month now ends on the 20th or something like that. Um, do you have any advice about time? Is there a better day of the month? I have a great story about how I went on a New Year's Eve thinking there's no way that they can change the year. Maybe they can change the month, but. Uh, yeah, I got a great deal on a car by going on like a super rainy day. 
Like it had been raining for a week straight. It was a Saturday and I didn't go with the intent to buy a car. I went with the intent to make sure that my <laughs> wife liked it to just okay. drive it. And like, there was crickets at this place on a Saturday. Like you, it was almost sad. Cause you're like, these guys are sitting around. Yeah. It's a Saturday. There's nobody here. And I said, yeah, I don't know. It's just driving. It's like, well, what if we could give it to you for this? And I'm like, for real. And they said, yeah, if you do you want it today. And so we did because it was such a good deal. So the, your new year's thing is a good example. What we always tell people is try to go at the end of some kind of a period at the end of the quarter, mm -hmm. at the end of the month, at the end of the year, those kinds of things when there's likely to be incentives mm. for selling a certain volume of car. Manufacturers will kick in incentives to the dealer as well. The manufacturer will say, hey, listen, if you sell this many Chevy Sonics or whatever it is, once you get over this, we'll give you an extra $75 per car. So there are things that kick in. Today, I don't know if that's applicable because the demand is so high and the, the, the inventory is so low. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, when it isn't a time like this, going at the end of some kind of a period generally can help you. And I also wouldn't go on the nicest spring day in the world when everybody else is there. I would go on a cold winter day. I would go, I would go at a time if, if, if getting a deal is important to you, yeah. I would go at a time when it's the most unpleasant time to <laughs> shop for a car because they want to get out of there. Nobody sure. else is, is coming that day. Like who else is coming to buy a car on Christmas Eve? That the, the bow on top of the car that you see on the commercials, I've never once seen that in real life. That's yeah. just for commercials. Right, right. Also the bow costs money, by the way. Did you know that? That's not free. I didn't know they did the bow. It's I didn't know they really did the bow. Nobody's ever given me a bow. Nobody's ever given me a car that, that had a bow on it. It's so. about $300. So if you want one that bad, you gotta yeah. let your family know right well, now. Well, as I said, I think my <laughs> wife will watch this. So just saying, uh, yeah. Um, I had a question from somebody about RVs. Now I know yeah. that's not necessarily the the bread and butter of yeah. Auto Trader, but do you have any sense of? I heard that there's a when I went through my pandemic uh, fantasies, one of them was that we were going to get an RV and ride it out in Montana or something, and then I woke up. But uh, so I did a little bit of research. Well, there is a a trend, and that's with these like upfitted vans. So like Chevy, Chevy, not Chevy, um, Mercedes Benz, the Sprinters, mm -hmm. and Nissan NVs. And for transit vans, these things, there's this trend of like buying them stripped and then you add what you want to it. And there are upfitters that will do that for you, make it into a little portable RV. Yeah. There's even a couple of articles we wrote on, on Auto Trader specifically because it was such a trend that could be identified. Um, there are certain things to look for. You know, there are certain vehicles that make better RVs than others. Sure. Um, you know, it is a little bit outside of my expertise, but it's definitely a trend where people are seeing, hey, I'm, I might not have to go back to work. I might be able to work from wherever. So would you rather work from uh, a national park in the Badlands mm -hmm. or would you rather work from, you know, a basement on an expensive house or the cafeteria of your local, you know, Ikea? It's kind of, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, actually, none of those really appeals to me when you when you put it like that. I think I'll stick to the uh, the partially the finished attic. National park wouldn't be so bad though. It you wouldn't be. But, there and... but I'm just thinking, what are you doing? You're tethering your to your phone. You're trying to, uh, you know, everybody be frustrated. We'd be cutting out left and right here. It would be it would be pretty difficult, I think. But uh, perhaps, yeah. Uh, actually, here's a good question. I want to I want to throw this one here. Yeah, actually, you know, you you're driving along, newer car low driver attention warning and stop and go traffic. I, I wonder this, like currently, how is that data collected? What it's used? I've, I mean, I, I think we've started to see people, you know, got in a car accident and the police are subpoenaing the records from Waze and whatnot. Where are right. we on this stuff? Uh, they're watching. I mean, what can you say? <laughs> I mean, there's biometric data. I mean, there, here, here's a perfect example of, um, you know, it, it, it's somehow the cars that have an attention monitor have to be watching you. Mm -hmm. There's no other way for that to work. Um, some of them are helpful. Like there's a Subaru feature that it senses when the car ahead moves and you haven't moved. It's, they don't call it, get off your phone, but they probably should call it that. Right. So those kinds of things, like the car has sensors and the car has ways of, you know, like it, it knows. The same with, you've seen a little thing where it says, time to take a break. It might not be watching your face, but it might be taking other pieces of data and collecting them. Mm -hmm. Like your driving is becoming more erratic. You're crossing the line more than you ought to. You're right. braking and accelerating 
there's all of this data that can be collected from your car that can tell something like that like mm -hmm. oh you're not paying attention it could just be as simple as and, and some of them like try closing your eyes certain subarus have a a, a monitor that kind of watches you try sitting there and closing your eyes let someone else steer or whatever and see what happens if you're sitting in your driveway doesn't seem that much safer but i get where, I get where you're safer. going yeah. <laughs> or you can cover it up or yeah. do this and right. you know there's a way that the the biometric data is being collected and it might just be data from the way you're driving yeah you know i think we are the weakest link in a lot of ways with cars you know and i don't and i don't there's i think there's always going to be the the enjoyment some people enjoy driving yeah. but when you talk about a lot of the commuting that people still do and you know i i get this one because we go on long trips that's we don't commute that much but when we go on long trips and the number of times i've just sat there thinking you know if these were all self-driving cars and each of them communicated with each other so you know that that person behind yeah. you is trying to get over to that right lane and this guy's got to get to the hospital and this guy doesn't really care how fast he's going i mean it'd be a beautiful world i know not everybody thinks that would be a beautiful world but i do <laughs> you know, i think there's going to be applications for that yeah i really do excellent well, Brian, hey, this has been great. I appreciate you being here with me today. Any last words of advice? I know you've covered a lot of this, but is there anything we missed if you're uh, trying to arm the readers of Understandably, the viewers of Understandably as they go out and do battle on car dealerships across the Fruited Plain this summer? I think the best thing is to just use the resources that are available. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes people, you know, car dealerships have sort of a, get a bad rap in some ways. It's like sometimes it just takes one to give everybody a bad name. But the truth is that these are like small businesses in your local community that contribute to the economy. Those are good jobs. So if you're out in the middle of nowhere in Indiana and you work at a Chevy dealership, that's a good job for those people. Like they're, they're going to be paid well, they get benefits. What I would say is there's no reason why you have to stay. If you go to a dealership and you feel like you're not being treated properly, mm -hmm. you don't have to stay. You can go somewhere else, Sure. like make them earn your business. They want to earn your business, but if they happen to get a bad apple or whatever, they're never going to know by you not saying anything. Mm -hmm. It's the same with any consumer experience. So I would say use the tools that are available online, go to the, the dealership website, go to the auto trader and search for the cars that you want and see how abundant they are in the first place. Because if a, if a dealer tells you, hey, we just don't have a lot of those, that might be the truth. Mm -hmm. And you may have to pay more to be the first person on your block to have X, Y, Z. If you don't like that, then you could go buy a different kind of a car or go visit a different place. And, but if you start hearing the same story repeatedly, you know, there's a good chance that what they're saying is true. Those cars are in short supply. So I, I would just, and I would ask for a salesperson that fits you and your personality. I, there's nothing wrong with that. If the pers first person that greets you, you just, you're like, this isn't going to work for me. Ask for somebody else. That's the beauty of it. Like it doesn't have to just be one way only. They want you to stay. And if you say, hey, the way, me, the way I'm going to stay is for you to give me something I want, which is I want to be served by um, a woman. I want to be served by a person who speaks my native language. I want to be served by a person who's whatever it is that you want. Tell them they'll, they'll find someone. I was laughing because I'm just thinking how I would describe that. But yeah, I want somebody who's going to, uh, you know, tell story after story, and we'll look at the <laughs> look at the clock, and it's four o'clock, and we haven't sold it yet. I, will, I want to add just one other thing because the comment here from Sarah is actually, I, I'm thinking I'll keep my 20, 2007 2007 CRV with 125,000 miles on it. I mean, I don't know if we can predict, but uh, well, first off, that's how that's how supply and demand works, right? If right. people look at this and say, yeah, I'm going to wait a year or two, yeah. But I wonder if if there will be kind of a a great uh, We've, we've been talking about the great resig, uh, resignations that's supposedly uh, happening with people leaving their jobs. Maybe we'll also have the uh, the great uh, hold on to the car an extra couple of years. Well, already the average car on the road, the average car used car that someone has is already more than 11 years old. Oh, wow. So we're already seeing people that's hold on to their cars. So that's okay. that's pretty old in terms of, you know, think about technology, fuel efficiency, all oh, that sure. kind of stuff. Yeah, historical standards too. I mean, those cars back in the 50s right. were not made to drive 11, <laughs> 11 years, yeah. That's true. That's yeah. exactly right. But what that tells you is that like, if I was driving a 125,000 mile Honda CRV and mm -hmm. it had the safety features that made me feel safe, mm -hmm. I would absolutely go buy another Honda because it's, they've proven to you what they, what they can do. True. Right? Like you don't have to take someone else's word for it. 
I put 300,000 miles on a Honda Accord one time and I bought another one after that. Yeah. So it's, it's, it could be the smart thing for you to do to keep your car because the, the more frequently you switch, even though it's fun, you're not necessarily <laughs> going to be saving money. That just depends on if that's what you want to do versus mm -hmm. I just want to have the newest, latest everything. You got it. Got it. All right. Hey, Brian, thank you for being here. Autotrader.com. Thank you all. I can't even find the number here, but there were 20 something people that joined us today. And I appreciate that. We're going to put this up on YouTube. I'll put a link in tomorrow's newsletter. Sure. Um, I'm Bill Murphy Jr. This is, if I can move the right way, understandably.com. Very high tech uh, display there. Thank you all for being yeah, here. Thank you. Have a great day.